All right, Jonathan Davis, Lacey Butler, your host on today's episode, If I Had to Choose or If I Had to Guess, Texas Longhorn Edition. You are Locked On Longhorns, your daily podcast on the Texas Longhorns. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Locked on Longhorns, the show, Jonathan Davis and Lacey Butler, your host. Today's episode of Locked on Longhorns brought to you by Game Time. Download the Game Time app, create an account, and use code Locked on College for $20 off your first purchase. Remember, terms and conditions do apply. Once again, on today's episode of Locked on Longhorns, all three segments, if I had to choose or if I had to guess, Texas Longhorn edition. I know what you're thinking at home or where you're ever listening, wherever you're watching this at. What is if I had to choose or if I had to guess? I promise you, I just made it up this morning. But <laughs> as you listen to the episode, it'll make perfect sense. <laughs> right? So finally got Lacey back on Locked on Longhorns. Starting next week, you know, fall camp, just August 1st. She'll be on pretty regularly. A lot going on in July, you know, namely Hurricane Barrel. <laughs> you know, but we're figuring it out as we go, right? We're figuring it out as we're we go. We're glad you're so. okay, though. We're glad everything's good. We're glad you're okay. You know, every, every, hey, everything could always be worse. So right, it could. And, so you know, uh, the fact that you're good, the fact that we're still even able to put out shows and everything is a blessing. So we're all good here. We're we're happy. We're right. excited. <laughs> there, there were a lot of people that didn't have like power and water for like two weeks. You know, thankfully, I never lost water. Power mm-hmm. came back on pretty quick. But like even Paul Wall, right? Like you would think Paul mm-hmm. Wall, he should be able to get his power back on pretty quick. And his was out for like two weeks. So um just perks of living in Houston, I guess. <laughs> you know what I mean? I guess those are the perks right. of living in Houston. But if I had to choose, slash if I had to yeah, guess right. my next destination, <laughs> right? It won't be Houston because of this weather. No, I'm just kidding. Not but. Houston. Now, here you go, Lacey. Like I said, if I had to choose, if I had to guess Texas Longhorn Edition, I just made this up this morning. So we'll see how it flows. Let's get right? it. My first question is, Lacey, if Texas has only one loss on their schedule this year, we're talking only regular season. If Texas has only one loss on their schedule this year, to who would it be? I feel like this one is pretty self-explanatory. It's Georgia. Like, I I feel like for, I feel like a lot of people would say Georgia simply based off the fact that, I mean, you're playing pre a preseason number one. They were a number one. They were the number one team pretty much the entirety of last season, you know, losing in the SEC championship game. A lot of them, a lot of people would still argue that they thought that Georgia just, or that Georgia should have been in the college football playoff over Alabama and over Texas. So it's like, I, I think that that's a pretty safe bet if if you're a betting man to if there is one game to lose on the schedule, I feel like that one is one that wouldn't be as much of a dagger to the heart. I can agree. Yeah, if Texas had only one loss on their schedule this year for me, um, who I would think it would be would probably be Georgia for the the reasons that you mentioned. Um, I think in terms of quarterback position, they can match what we have in Quinn Ewers with Carson Beck. Um, I've said it a million times, but I had Max Chadwick on from Pro Football Focus. And, you know, he talked about how Ohio State and Georgia are the only two teams that each position group is ranked in the top 10 in the country from quarterback all the way to safety ranked in the top 10 in the country. And Kirby Smart does a really good job of making Georgia feel like they're not Georgia. (laughs) I don't know how he does it, but, you know, with them not making the playoffs last year, he has bs to They've sell got the them, right biggest chip can, on their shoulder right now <laughs> have the biggest chip on their shoulder this year for no reason so if i had to pick one loss on the schedule then of course it would be the best team that texas is going to play probably the only team texas won't be favored against at the time of kick it's going to be georgia lacy if texas has only two losses on their schedule this year who would those two losses be to i said georgia and michigan You know, Michigan, week two, tough, going to the big house in a very hostile environment, a very well-known, amazing college football environment. It's new for most of the entirety of our team outside of Quinn Ewers, who has not even played, you know, but he's been to the big house. He's been in that environment, so he, he still calls him the team up north, but I, I think a lot of people are underestimating Michigan a lot with how much they've lost with a new coaching staff, all of that stuff. But a lot of people aren't really taking into consideration what they're actually returning. And they're returning a lot of very core guys, defensively, offensively, Donovan Edwards, um, Kenneth Grant, Will Johnson, those types of guys that 
were impact players for them last season. They they were able to keep them, and Sharon Moore showed that he could go in and win and keep up the Michigan standards. So I mean, that that that's a game that I'm I'm nervous about, especially it being earlier on in the in the schedule with with it being week two. Right. Um, if Texas only has two losses on their schedule this year, uh, to me, I would probably have the same answer. I would think Georgia and Michigan. Um, you know, Michigan, when we look at that game, you know, it's on the road. It's going to be 110,000 people strong. And, you know, that's the type of environment that shouldn't rattle Texas, but could rattle Texas. Also, when you look at how Michigan's going to want to play in that game, they're going to have a new quarterback, right? A quarterback making his second start presumably against Texas. And so they're going to want to run the football. Like you said, Donovan mm -hmm. Edwards, uh, you know, cover athlete at NCAA 25 back up to Blake Corum last year. But a lot of people thought that Donovan Edwards was their best back. They're going to want to run the ball a lot. Right. And without Tavondre Sweat and Byron Murphy, we can't come in and say we're boasting the third best run defense in the country again because we don't know what it's going to look like. So um, I think that that's a game where Michigan is going to try to ground and pound. They're going to try to shorten the game, win time of possession and just run out the clock with them having mm -hmm. a lead. Um, and you know, in terms of defense, I do think that they have the type of defense with, you know, Mason Graham at D tackle. You talked about Will Johnson at corner. They have really good linebackers, just, you know, a ton of talent at every position on that defense. That is the type of defense that could come out and shut down a Texas offense while they keep, you know, time of possession and keep the ball, you know, in their hands on offense. So I do think that Texas will beat Michigan in week two, but if we had two losses on the schedule, the two teams I would probably pick for those two losses would be Georgia and Michigan to hand those out to the University of Texas. Now it's where it gets interesting. If Texas has three mm. losses on their schedule this year, to what three teams would it be if they went nine and three in the regular season? I'm very, very interested to see what you say on this. But for me, I'm going to get I'm going to get a lot of hate on this one. But I said that I think the three losses on the schedule would be to Georgia, Michigan and Arkansas. I think I, I not that well, let's just go ahead and make it clear. Texas is the better football team. I'm not going to sit here and say that I think that Arkansas is the better football team. But 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 with the with where exactly it fits into our schedule between Florida, between Kentucky, both of those games are at home. The Arkansas game is in Fayetteville, very hostile environment. We know exactly what happened when we went in 2021 pretty embarrassing they were they're they're still riding that high you know so uh, i i think it being in a very vulnerable position in between two home games and then right before the very very emotional revamped lone star shootout it's two weeks before that so i just think it's in a very precarious part of our schedule where we could fall victim to nap time we could fall victim to just very easily overlooking Arkansas, very, very easily overlooking that part of the schedule. And Sam Pittman said him, said it himself. You know, Arkansas fans, they hate Texas more than they love Arkansas most of the time. So it's not going to be an easy game. And I think that that's definitely a game where we could kind of fall asleep at the wheel and set up as a trap game. Yeah, so let me say that first of all, Texas is not going to go nine and three in the regular season. No, nine, no, nine this is in the regular season next year would feel like five and seven did in twenty twenty one. I'm yeah. being dramatic, but it would be a huge step back from what we did last year. Even if we're taking a step up in competition, even if we're moving to a new conference, major disappointment if, if we go nine and three. Three losses on their schedule this year. I probably would receive even more hate. Yeah, I, I think <laughs> the three losses yeah. would be Georgia, Michigan. And Texas A&M, if we had three losses, right? And I've already talked about Georgia and Michigan. This is why I think Texas A&M could potentially be a loss, right? Mm -hmm. Kyle Field is one of the hardest places to play in college football. There's going to be a lot of burnt orange there for sure. It's going to be a lot of Texas fans. It's going to be a lot of Texas A&M fans, right? I'm assuming that at the point of this game, Texas will have a lot more to lose than Texas A&M, right? This is not me saying that Texas A&M is going to be bad or anything like that this year. But Texas is going to be fighting for an SEC championship berth. Texas is going to be fighting for seeding in the playoffs. Like, and Texas is just big brother, right? <laughs> so this is one of those games where you win it. It's like, okay, cool. You won it. You lost it. It's like, what? You lost that mm -hmm. game, right? Yeah. Where AM just gets out there, gets to go out there and play free with house money. 
-hmm. If you lose to Texas, you lost to Texas last time you played them. You're not on the same level as a program, right? You just continue being A and M, right? Which is mm -hmm. little brother to Texas. Yeah. But if you beat Texas, all of a sudden us taking their baseball coach doesn't matter. Nothing yeah. else matters but the fact that they get to talk about beating Texas and one of the best teams we've had in over a decade for the next calendar year. So I just think that there's so mm -hmm. much surrounding this game that that pressure could weigh on the players. And in that situation, it could lead to A&M getting a victory because, like I said, A&M is strictly playing with house money. All they're trying yeah. to do is go in there and upset Texas, where mm -hmm. Texas will be playing to beat A&M. They'll be playing to get into the SEC championship game. And all that, that pressure could build diamonds. Or it could burst pipes, right? A quick word yeah. from our sponsors. And then we get into the next segment of if I had to choose or if I had to guess. <laughs> Today's episode of Locked on Longhorns with Jonathan Davis and Lacey Butler. I just wanted to say that brought to you by Game Time. Game Time is an authorized ticket marketplace of Major League Baseball, which makes getting tickets faster and easier. Prices on the Game Time app actually go down the closer it gets to first pitch. And some of my favorite features of the Game Time app are priority last-minute deals. Save up to 60% off buying last-minute for sports, concerts, comedy, theater, etc. Flash deals save even more with exclusive in-app deals on select seats ahead of the game or event. Zone deals, you save even more when you choose a section and let Game Time choose the seats. All-in pricing, toggling this feature shows the total up front with no surprise fees at checkout. Seat views, get a panoramic view from your seat in the app before you buy. And the lowest price guarantee or game time will credit you 110% of the difference. Take the guesswork out of buying MLB tickets with game time. Download the game time app, create an account, and use code Locked On College for $20 off your first purchase. Remember, terms apply. Again, create an account and redeem code Locked On College for $20 off. Download game time today. Last-minute tickets, lowest prices guaranteed and don't look now but the rangers are only three games down in the al west so get your rangers tickets as we make this push to win the division and get back to the playoffs to defend our crown as world series champions <laughs> all right <laughs> shameless plug you know what i mean had to get my rangers in there we're playing winning i'm baseball. a coast fan I'm so i'm sitting here like let me mind my business. <laughs> right. We're, we're, we're playing winning baseball again, so I got to start talking about my Rangers again, especially when there's no WNBA games to August 15th. What are we doing? But anyway. <laughs> so my next question for you, Lacey. If Arch Manning replaced Quinn Ewers this year, what would the reason be? I feel like we probably have the exact same answer. So, I mean... I mean, I feel like the obvious answer is injury. You know, uh, he hasn't always been, uh, he hasn't had a fully healthy season since his junior year, since his junior year in high school. You know, so it's, it, it's been a long time since Quinn has had a fully healthy, complete season at the quarterback position. And obviously we haven't seen it at Texas. So Arch Manning or the backup has had to step up and play a game or two every single year that Quinn has been here. So I think obviously Arch has the it factor. We saw it versus Texas Tech. I, I don't know about everybody else, but I was at the Texas Tech game and I was sitting there screaming. I was like, throw the ball, let him throw it. Because why not? At that point, we're up by a million. So that's all we wanted to see. We wanted to see Arch sling it, you know? And so we were really, really excited. But I just think that to make the statement that we want to in the SEC as newbies, you need you need a healthy starting quarterback. So I think the only true real reason, unless Quinn just comes in and absolutely just shits the bed, I just think that injury would be his biggest kind of inhibitor. That was the word I was That's looking a good for. Word, Sorry, right? I was I was looking at your face. I'm like, what is she gonna? Come I was up trying with? to think. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. I had to create suspense with my face, but we do have the same answer. I just don't see a yeah. scenario in which, you know, Quinn Ewers could get replaced due to performance, right? Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, obviously it could happen. Yeah. But I just think he's too set up for su to succeed with everything that's around him. But it's not just like Quinn Ewers will be a product of what's around him. Everything no. we've heard is that he's already a better quarterback visually than what we saw last year, right? So I, I don't think. You know, I mean, he's a Heisman candidate for a reason, right? I think he'll be good enough to be the starter throughout the season. 
Yeah. I think, like you said, you know, Quinn Ewers, his junior year, he dealt with the hernia. And then your senior year, he opted out. Uh, the Alabama game, he gets hurt with the, the AC joint or the shoulder, whatever it was. And then the Houston game last year, he gets hurt with, I think, the same thing, a shoulder injury. Mm-hmm. So like you said, his last three years as a starter, he has missed time due to injury. So this question could have, you know, invoked a spicy answer. But I think the answer we both agree on that Arch Manning would replace Quinn Ewers because Quinn Ewers would struggle to stay healthy. It would have nothing to do with performance. My next question for you is, if Sark, now he's already said that he would plan to use more than three wide receivers, right? Mm -hmm. But I can only go off what we saw from 2021 to 2023. If Sark still is so stubborn that he (laughs) only uses three wide receivers this year at a high level, I'm talking about like our fourth receiver you know, has 10 catches or less like last year with John T. Cook, right? Yeah. So if Stark only uses three right receivers this year, who would those three be? So I said, you got your two on the outside. You got John T. Cook and Isaiah Bond. And then I said, you put DeAndre Moore in the slot. I really, really like the versatility and how deep our receiver room is. So you like, you really could have so many different answers for this question because there are so many different ways that Sark could scheme up all of these guys because there's speed there's physicality there uh there they can go up and uh fight for those contested catches those 50 50 balls you know john tay cook's footwork is insane you know his his ability to get in get in and out of routes quickly and with with haste <laughs> i couldn't think of a better way to say <laughs> yeah. that but it's it's yeah. <laughs> It's second to very, very few. He's very, very talented in that aspect. And then obviously you got double number seven, Isaiah Bond, Mr. Fourth and 31 himself has proven that he can come up with big time catches in big time moments. So obviously that's going to be another guy. And then DeAndre Moore, I feel like, I, I feel like DeAndre Moore is a little bit slept on. I really, really like his playmaking ability and his physical ability to be able to, I feel like with his size, and his quick step, he can be a very big threat in the red zone. So I, I feel like I, I feel like I like that little rotation of guys for Sark. But what about you? What are you what are you thinking? Like I like I said, there's so many answers to this question. Right. That's why I was coming up with this today. I'm like, these are some fire questions. Yes, I don't know for who Sark sure. would pick specifically. Um, I was kind of thinking about that. Like, I don't know who Sark would pick or who Sark's best picks would be but if you could only utilize three it would feel so incomplete yeah but if you can only <laughs> utilize three wide receivers in this offense to me number one you have to go isaiah bond you know i just think he's your best receiver closest thing you have to xavier worthy um obvious number one target for uh quinn ewers and i think out of our receiver core he is the receiver i would pick first to win the Bolitnikov, or the receiver i would pick first to uh be an all American or like first team mm-hmm. at his position. You know what I mean? Like, I just think that Isaiah bond is the best receiver on the team. I love that you called him Mr. Fourth and 31. I mean, that's one of the greatest plays. Literally. We've ever seen in college football. And it feels like Isaiah bond is just scratching the surface of what he can accomplish. Like you remember he's been in, you know, this Nick Saban offense, you know, last year he was with Jalen Milrow. Now he's in Sark's offense with Quinn Ewers. I think he only had like 660 yards last year. Like, you know what I mean? Like, we're about to see a completely mm-hmm. different version of Isaiah Bond. So I would have him there. Two, I would put John T. Cook. Like you said, just his experience in the system. You know, Matthew Golden may be more experienced in college football, but I think John mm-hmm. T. Cook's experience in the system, uh, top 45 recruit out of high school, just one of the b- best route runners I've seen, especially coming out of <laughs> high school. Um, deep speed, short to intermediate speed, quickness. I just think he can do everything in this offense outside Hands. and inside. <laughs> Hands too, right? A complete receiver for sure. Very polished. I think my third receiver or slot receiver is where I would differ from you and where people mm-hmm. may be a little surprised. And I would go with Silas Bolden. I think yeah. the reason I would go with Silas Bolden, he's 5'8". A lot of people are going to say he's a gadget player because of his size. But when you watch the film, he plays so much bigger than that. And he's so explosive. Literally every time the ball is in his hands, is in his hands <laughs> He's a threat to hit his head on the goalpost. And he can play every position on the offense, obviously outside of, you know, offensive line, quarterback, and tight end, right? If you want to put him on the outside, he can play that. He did it at Oregon State, right? You want to put him on the mm-hmm. inside, he can do that. He did it at Oregon State. You want to put him at running back, halfback, 
whatever, he can do that. He did it at a high level at Oregon State. So if we're talking about only three wide receivers and the versatility and how you could attack defenses, I think Silas Bolden as that third receiver would give Sark so many options next to Isaiah Bond and John Tay Cook compared to DeAndre Moore, Ryan Wingo, or other players who may be more complete receivers but don't mm-hmm. necessarily bring the versatility that – Silas Bolden would, but DeAndre Morris, Silas Bolden, I don't think you could go wrong with either one, right? That's why I said there's so many different answers to that question, and none of them are necessarily wrong. You know, there there are so many different because Sark does so many different things with his receivers and in his offense that they're they're gonna get their they're gonna get their touches, they're gonna get their playing time, and we're gonna see a lot out of a lot of these guys. And I'm really, really, really excited. (laughs) Right, and I know Sark's gonna use more than three wide receivers, so we don't even have to worry about that. Right. Next question. (laughs) I have is if one player was to come off the bench and outperform a starter this season, who would it be? Jaden Blue. Mm, I say that with quickness. I I I love love Jaden Blue. I am so freaking excited (laughs) to see what Jaden Blue is able to do this season. This is absolutely nothing against CJ Baxter. I love what CJ is able to bring to the table, and I'm really excited to see what he is able to do in year two. But Jaden Blue is lightning in a bottle. Jaden Blue is Jaden Blue is an expo- explosive play waiting to happen with the ball in his hands. And uh, number six running back in his class, I just really, really think that Jaden Blue is going to wake a lot of people up this season with his ability to just find the hole and get through it. You know, he's he's gone and then he's not. You know, like you you see him disappear behind the lineman and then you just see him bust to, towards the edge and he's gone. You know, he, like I said, lightning in a bottle, super fast. I I love his ability to catch the ball out of the backfield as well. I think that that's going to be a big way that Sark is going to be able to utilize him as well. And so that's, that was a very, very easy answer for me. (laughs) What what about you? I I know you got excited for that one. So, (laughs) right. Yeah. I think Jaden Blue's the best running back on the team. So, you know, I mean, there's no, you know, gripe with me there. Uh, if one player were to come to come off the bench and outperform a starter this season, um, I have a lot of different answers for this. Yeah. Um, some very spicy, some moderately spicy. Um, I'm gonna I'm gonna give you a little tame answer because I'm, I'm gonna save my spicy answer for a question later. Mm-hmm. I'm gonna say Colin Simmons, and I don't, you know, when you look at it, last year it was Anthony Hill, right? We knew mm-hmm. when David Bender was announced as the starter that Anthony Hill was better, and it only took about two yeah. games for him to actually yeah. show us that, right? But it's like, okay, you're going with David Bender, the experience, Anthony Hill, it's going to take him time. And then, like I said, Alabama game, he looked like a superstar, right? Mm-hmm. Baron Sorrell and Trey Moore are likely going to be your starters at edge going into the season, right? Or it could be Trey Moore and Ethan Burke. Any, like, combination of those combination, three players, yeah. right? Trey Moore and then either Ethan Burke or Baron Sorrell. But we know Colin Simmons is the all-world blue-chip prospect that's supposed to be the next elite edge rusher at the University of Texas. So like last year where you just couldn't keep Anthony Hill off the field, right? Maybe this year, Baron Terrell or Ethan Burke start off really good. But by the end of 12 games, we're saying we can't keep Colin Simmons off the field. Yeah. <laughs> like Baron Terrell and Ethan Burke are really good, but Colin Simmons is all-world. So if I had to pick one player right now that could come off the bench and outperform the starters, it's our blue-chip prospect in Colin Simmons. All right, quick word from our sponsors, and then we get into our last segment of if I had to choose or if I had to guess, Longhorn Edition. I'm having so much fun today. I love this. (laughs) All right, Lacey, this is an interesting one. I didn't mean to do that. If Texas had multiple Heisman finalists this year, who would they be? I feel like my answer, see, I feel like a lot of these answers I chose were kind of tame and kind of like pretty obvious, but I obviously went with Quinn Ewers and Isaiah Bond, you know, obviously I feel like that's the, that's the one, two punch that's Quinn Ewers is already in Heisman talks, Heisman contention, you know, he's got like, I think the second best Heisman odds according to Vegas. So obviously his name is being brought up in Heisman conversations already based off of what they've seen in the past and his ceiling, I think is what a lot of people are really excited to see with Quinn this season, but you got to have your number one target. And if Quinn takes the necessary steps forward that we think that he is, whether it be physically in his own self-confidence in his confidence with his receivers in the, the way that the team chemistry works, 
I, I just really, really think that his connection with Isaiah Bond is going to be electric. I, I'm really, really excited to see that connection. And I think that if anybody is going to be in Heisman contention with Quinn, it's going to be Isaiah Bond because of what, I, where I think that connection can be this season. Yeah. Um, I started to think of a different answer, like while you were talking and I was just going to like make up something and say Anthony Hill. Now, if <laughs> Anthony Hill does have like a Jalen Ford 2022 yeah. season, a hundred mm -hmm. tackles, like five sacks, five interceptions, and yeah. Texas is one of the best teams in the country, then, you know, certainly he could uh, make some noise. But if we're talking about a top five or top three, then, yeah, it's really the scenario you described. You know, I think the last time we saw it was Mac Jones and Devontae Smith mm -hmm. in a Sark offense. Right. Yeah, but if literally. You know, Quinn Ewers and uh, I was about to say Devontae Smith, if Quinn Ewers and Isaiah Bond are so explosive that Quinn Ewers statistically looks like the best quarterback in the country and Isaiah Bond statistically looks like the best or one of the best receivers in the country, which certainly could happen, you know, in yeah. uh, a top five offense, which I expect it to be this year, then, yeah, those would be the most two likely candidates to, you know, win the Heisman or represent the University of Texas for the Heisman would be Quinn Ewers and Isaiah Bond. If any true freshman was to make a freshman All-American team, who would it be? So this one is the one that I had a little bit more fun with. I said Alex January. I am very, very, very excited to see what Alex January does this upcoming season. I think that with what we've seen, what we saw in the state championship game last season, he, t you know, Colin Simmons is the face of the D-line or was the face of the D-line at Duncanville. But Alex January was kind of the the brunt, the 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 not the brains, but like the the beefy, the beefy part of that equation because he, his disruption and his, the way that he attacks quarterbacks and the way that he is able to disrupt the passing game is very Byron Murphy esque, and I, I think that in a position of need, in a position group where we need somebody to step up and really make a name for themselves, I'm very 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 excited to see what a guy like Alex January is able to do in in that situation you know so like I like I said I feel like that one's a little bit more spicy maybe a little bit I don't know what about you what do you think <laughs> yeah, I, I, yeah that I was not thinking about Alex January at all so that's definitely a really good one um two honorable mentions would be yeah. probably only due to injury but Kobe Black would probably be next in mm. line if one of your outside corners got hurt or Jared Gibson might be next in line if one of your running backs, Jaden Blue or Cedric Baxter, gets hurt. We know Cedric Baxter dealt with some injuries last year. So those would be kind of, you know, they could step in right away as starters and have an inside track to being a freshman All-American. But I'm going to give an even more spicy answer, right? I'm going to say Brandon Baker. What happens Ooh. if we determine that Cam Williams – is not the best option at right tackle at some point during the season. And we put in freshman five-star Brandon Baker, and he has a Kelvin Banks-type impact on that right side his freshman year, right? How many freshman offensive line start period, linemen start, period? So if we bring him in on a, one of the best football teams in the country, he pretty much is a lot, right, to be a freshman yeah. All-American, right? So, yeah. You know, I love Cam Williams, love his size. Interesting yeah. to see how he is as a pass blocker. But if that becomes a problem this season, they potentially could replace him with true freshman Brandon Baker. That could potentially be your freshman All-American. But I know that's a pretty spicy answer, right? Hopefully that's that a doesn't good happen. one, though. You know, hopefully Cam Williams doesn't have to get upseated no. at some point during the season for that to happen, right? I think Longhorn and Nation not, would Longhorn Nation would melt down. Like, we, <laughs> we'd we be pissed. All right, Cam Williams is a, is a fan favorite. But I, I feel like, yes. I, I don't know, I just. I love Brandon Baker. I feel like once he oh, got I, in there, I love he, he wouldn't look back. You know what I mean? So it was everything that Kyle Flood and them have done on the offensive line has just been mwah, chef's kiss. I love what right. Kyle Flood and Sark has been able to do on the offensive line since they've got here. And it just it just continues to show with the recruiting and the development and how they're able to produce on that side of the ball. So I, I agree with that answer wholeheartedly. <laughs> right, right. But like I said, hopefully – Cam Williams doesn't get replaced because if you yeah, heard, let's not plan up the part. All right, let's not put that. Um, let's not put that in the universe. Yeah, and hopefully yeah, he doesn't get hurt either. Obviously, no. All right, my last question is: If Texas had a scare against a team they absolutely should not have a scare against, who would it be? I said Arkansas because I said I mean it makes sense with what I was saying earlier. Just hostile environment, basically for the exact same reasons. Hostile environment. It's in a very precarious part of the schedule where I feel like we could fall victim to nap time. We could fall victim to falling asleep at the wheel. 
getting overexcited for the Lone Star shootout and just that kind of being the wake up call that we need at that point in the schedule to be like, oh, shit, we've got A&M in a couple of weeks. Maybe we need to kick it into gear and not, you know, sleepwalk through the rest of this schedule. I think that that is a very, very, very dangerous game to be playing going into Fayetteville with a team that and a team and a fan base that absolutely hates us anyways. I, I, I just think that, that that that's a very scary game for me. And I, I don't like that. <laughs> I don't like that at right. all. What what about you? Like when it comes to scare though, like do you, are, when you say scare, are you talking about like scared that we're gonna lose or just scare like, oh, that one was really, really close, like a Kansas State. Like, what was your interpretation of that? Scare like a game that we all feel really good about it, and then it's close. Like last year yeah. when it was tied 10-10 against Wyoming in the fourth quarter. That's a scare, right? Yeah. Even though we outscored them 21-0 to zero and made it look good in the fourth, like that's a scare for sure. Two years ago we were down UTSA 17-7 to seven, the week after the Bama game. That's a scare, right? Like, 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 uh, like the SpongeBob, the yeah, exactly. <laughs> right. So in that, with that contextualization, I wouldn't consider Arkansas or AM scares, right? Yeah, Even though we're that's better fair. than both of those football teams, those are rivalries, right? Yeah. Anything can happen in those environments, especially on the road in front of those hostile crowds. If we beat AM by three, shit, I'm glad we got out of there with a win, right? If yep. we beat Arkansas by three. I'm glad we got out of there with a win. I'm not mm-hmm. holding that against the Texas football team. That's For fair. Me, if Texas had a scare against a team they absolutely should not have a scare against, and I know people are going to laugh when they hear this, to me it would be Vanderbilt. And I know what people are thinking. Vanderbilt's not going to be Texas. You're right, right? <laughs> That's why it's called a scare, right? Like, yeah. It's not called a horror movie. It's called a scare. It's not. Right? Not be Texas, right? But I've seen... In 2022, Texas almost beat Alabama and then come back and lay an egg in the first half against UTSA the very next week. Mm -hmm. Then I watched Texas beat Alabama on the road last year and then come back and lay an egg and be tied with Wyoming in the fourth quarter at home. Yeah. What's stopping this Texas team from beating Georgia at home or playing Georgia really close in a hard-fought game Filling themselves all week, flying down to Nashville, one of the best party cities in America, right? Mm -hmm. And just completely disregarding that, uh, not Nashville, completely disregarding that Vanderbilt football team. And then having to be woken up at halftime because they disregarded the Vanderbilt football team. Now, when I say scare, I don't mean Vanderbilt's going to be up at halftime. I don't mean that we think we're going to lose. But I honestly think that depending on how that Georgia game goes, it could be a one possession game at halftime against Vanderbilt. And to me or to anybody else in Longhorn Nation, that should be scary. There you go. (laughs) So I think if there's any team that we have no business hanging around with that we're going to hang around with this year, I think it'll be Vanderbilt after the Georgia game. And then I think eventually talent will win out and we'll turn up on them. But yeah. I do think that game will be relatively close until about after halftime, depending on how the Georgia game goes. Now, if Georgia smacks us by 30, yeah. then obviously Vanderbilt doesn't want to play us that next week, right? Well, <laughs> if, think- if we get smacked by Georgia, if we get if Georgia smacks us by 30, we have other issues. Right, we can have exactly. plenty of other problems. <laughs> exactly. But I, I do think Vanderbilt is the one team on the schedule this year that Texas is going to walk in like they're the old Texas. And at least, like yeah. I said, for the first two quarters – it's going to be way too close for comfort. I can see that. For us okay. Yeah. You convinced me. You convinced me. <laughs> I hope I didn't, <laughs> right? Because I hope me. it doesn't happen. Right? No, I hope that doesn't happen either. But I, my PTSD is like, yeah, I can see that. <laughs> That's right. a thing. <laughs> exactly. All right. So thank you all for tuning in to the first edition of If I Had to Choose or If I Had to Guess. This was such a success that obviously we have to bring it back at some point on Locked on Longhorns. But thank you for tuning in to another episode. So glad to have Lacey Butler on here today. And of course, she'll be a staple of the show moving forward. To all of y'all, hook them. Peace. Hook them horns.